Hello everyone! Tonight I'm going to be interviewing Renee Ritchie and we're going to be talking about Macintoshes or Macs. You're asking me, is it about these old Macs? No, 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 these are old. We're talking about the new M1 Mac, the 16 inch and 14 inch for content creation and live streaming. So you got the new Macs. How are you liking them so far? I had very high expectations. I've been waiting for this almost 10 years, uh, ever, especially ever since Apple came out in 2013 and announced the A7, the first 64-bit chipset for the Mac, sorry, for the, for the iPhone. This moment, you could feel it coming. It's, I've been waiting so long for this, and it exceeded my expectations. It is better than I thought it would be. The new M1 chips are so powerful. I feel like... I could run an 8K stream off of it. You know, like I could rent a 8K Red Dragon and stream 4K, <laughs> and it wouldn't be a problem. And it would like be like 10% CPU. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean they announced uh, not yeah. for live streaming, but just for streaming within something like Final Cut Pro or Resolve, yeah. like 30 streams of 4K, seven streams of 8K. In Justine's video, she did Final Cut tests and uh, DaVinci Resolve tests with 8K footage running all sorts of temporal um, effects on them, and it played back in real time, which it, it's it's mind-blowing. And Nantech, which is not, you know, and Nantech, they like PCs and they like Android, and they, they're only impressed by Apple's technology. And I think Andre's uh, conclusion was that this is just... You've, we've never seen this in a laptop before. We've hardly ever seen it in desktop. And you really need like dedicated servers, server systems to get this most of the time in real life. Yeah. Some people like to use desktops for streaming and content creation because it has so much power. What would you say to them if they just picked up the Mac Mini and they want more power? Would you recommend the 14-inch or would you just recommend the baseline iMac or the old iMac that was from 2017 or the M1 one? So it, it really it really does depend on what you want to do with it. And there's always going to be some people who just money is not an issue and they like having the latest and greatest and they're going to buy it no matter what. Like it's not about need, it's about want. Uh, you know, like instead of buying jewelry or vacations or, or fancy cars, they just always have to have the latest tech. So, you know, they're going to buy it anyway. But if you're really thinking about it, just think about what you're doing now, your current workflow, and are you hitting any barriers? Like, I know like Luria, for example, will say like have a dedicated machine for streaming, but maybe you do do multiple things on it and that's causing you some problems. Or maybe you're hitting a wall when it comes to <clears throat> processing your videos later. Like if you're gonna t take down your stream, re-edit it, re-upload it, it's taking too long. Uh, it's frustrating because you can't do it in real time. You're getting a lot of beach balls, anything that's causing you pain. If you do have a roadblock, if you are hitting a wall, then this is an easy way, an easy but expensive way to fix that because you're literally just throwing more compute uh, at your problems. Yes. Have you tested out the new Macs? Like, editing, did they get hot? So did they get warm. So I, like, I, I tested them against a 14-inch Intel yeah. MacBook Pro, 13-inch from last year, and a 16-inch. Uh, so the 13-inch in was an i5. I also tested a, against a 16-inch i9. And this, the i9, the fans come on immediately. They sound like the Shield helicarrier. And they get so hot, I can't hold my fingers down on top of the keyboard for more than five seconds. Like, it's too uncomfortable to hold it down there. With these, depending on what I throw at them, how hard the test is, I can get the fans to come on. They're not as loud. They go off almost immediately. And it's never uncomfortably warm. Like, it's, it's warm. You can feel it. But, like, you could just leave your hand there all day. It wouldn't be a problem. So you can hear the fan? Yes. Interesting, because, like, even if you're web browsing, can you hear the fan or no? No, you have to make it come on. Like, with, with the oh. M1 MacBook Pro, yeah. it would take me about 20 minutes to get it to spin wow. up. Um, this can do way more than that, but yeah. I can get the fan to spin up faster. Like, I told it to do ProRes export, for example. That's And crazy. that's one of the things where... yeah. Yeah, you don't like you don't expect it on the Intel Macs. It took like twenty to thirty minutes. Yeah, even on the M1 MacBook Pro, it took like a dozen minutes. It took wow. two minutes 
on the on the M1 on the M1 Max. Two minutes uh, to go, or three minutes, sorry, to go through that. It was ten times faster than the Intel model, which is just mind numbing. Because like not only like if it's your job, because not everybody just exports one video. Sometimes you have a compressor running, and you're doing one video for YouTube, one video for Vimeo, for Facebook. You're doing one for Instagram, and you're doing all these different sizes, or maybe you're doing higher ver- like higher and lower quality versions, and you have to batch them. That's like ten times saving on ten videos. Like you're t- you're talking about significant time, uh, and it it really does take all of those things. Like it's no longer oh I'm going to render the video. I'll go out for lunch. I'll come back later. It'll be done. It's like before I've gone up to get my keys. The video's done. That is crazy. Now, have you actually tested this? Is this new Mac faster than the the fifty thousand dollar Mac Pro? So yeah, it depends on which Mac Pro, but like some yeah. ways, but not really. Like it is as good as a high mid range Mac Pro with caveats. So like what Apple's done here is is make dedicated silicon. So for example, the reason it's so fast at ProRes is even faster than the M1 MacBook Pro is because on the Pro uh, version of this chip, there's a dedicated ProRes encode decode block, and on the Max version, there's two dedicated ProRes encode decode blocks. And that's similar to what we saw with the Mac Pro when Apple announced the Afterburner card, which was a dedicated ASIC, a reprogrammable ASIC card that its only job was to accelerate ProRes. And that was 2019. And now, like two years later, they've taken that giant card and they've condensed it down to these two tiny, tiny blocks or four tiny blocks for the Max card right on the chipset. And that's doing all the work that would otherwise go to the CPU. Uh, Because like like on Intel and on the M1, that's being done by the CPU. This is being done almost entirely off the main cores. So why have you been waiting for over 10 years for this new machine? You could sort of see, like when Apple announced they were transitioning from uh, the PowerPC chipset to Intel, the whole argument Steve Jobs made, the rationale he gave, the explanation was they needed better power per watt. Like anybody can make anything fast. When you're when you're talking about silicon, there's only two gating factors. And that is the time you have to make it and the thermal envelope of the device you're making it for. And back then, PowerPC was just, it was too big and too hot and they literally couldn't put it in the laptop. They promised to make a PowerBook with that chip. They couldn't do it. And Intel was offering much better power per watt. And what that means is that they could handle all those tasks without pulling as much power. And the more power you pull, the hotter you you, you get. Um, and sometimes you're just so hot, you can't run in a laptop uh, anymore. And so that was starting to become the problem with Intel. They started missing their roadmaps, their deadlines, their chips, they couldn't get to 10 nanometers. Uh, they were at 14 nanometers for a long time. And instead to get more performance, they were adding more cores and adding more voltage, which works, but not in a laptop, especially not an Apple style laptop, and especially not a laptop that you want to use on battery. And their problem, I think, is the essential problem of like AMD and Intel is that they had these huge bread and butter server chips that they were trying to shrink down and put inside a laptop. And in the server room, none of that stuff is a problem. Like server rooms sound like helicarriers. They're just full of air conditioning all the time. Does not matter. But in a laptop, it really does. And Apple was used to making chips that could run in phones, like little tiny phones really efficiently. And so now they can do as much work as the Xeon chips in a mid, like a fairly mid to high sized Mac Pro, but with the same kind of power efficiency that they were getting in iPads and iPhones, which is kind of ludicrous when you think about it. Yeah, that is so crazy. So I know people in the streamer community, if you're using Ecamm, some people use OBS. Ecamm's amazing, no problems with that. But my question is, people say you have to upgrade. Upgrade this because this has more performance, this has more power. What are your thoughts? Because people used to say five years and it's not good. What are your thoughts on like the Mac Mini M1 and the newer M1s that just got released? How would you explain it and... How long should you keep it? Because I feel like some people will keep it for 10 years, you you know, because it will run so fast. And if they spend $6,000, why would they spend it in two years? You know what I mean? 
Yeah. So, I mean, there's a few factors that cover that. Like, so I'm going to address this. Like if you have a bunch of clients, like if you're doing client work and you basically pay off that computer with one or two jobs, then it, it just pay, like Doc says this a lot too. Like you're basically, it's, it's your life. It's how you make your money. It's your income. And you just upgrade it as often as you have to, because time is more important than money. So you've got to do those equations. But if you're on a budget or it's just not where you want to prioritize your resources, you can get away with using these computers for years because they are really, really good. The, the challenge comes in with like, what do you want to do? You can do one thing relatively well, let's say. Now, do you want to do that thing better? Like, let's say Ken and Glenn see these new computers and they go bonkers adding all sorts of special shaders and effects like blurs and multiple masks and all these real time layers. And suddenly you have like, you can turn yourself into crystal if you want to, and it'll calculate the refraction index of your environment. Like there's all sorts of things that they can do, but that's going to be a much higher processor load. Or if you want to do a few things at once, like for example, let's say you're, you're a gaming streamer and you only have one rig and you can't afford to do it separately. And you want to be able to game on the machine while you're streaming it. And you're also, you know, recording and doing all these things at once, then you're going to have to have something that can not only handle all of the different compute tasks you're giving it, but have enough RAM to just keep feeding all that stuff the whole time. Because like people will often say one job, one core, you know, two gigs of memory. There's like little formulas like that. So you got to figure out what you're doing and then add those things up. Am I doing one thing? Then, you know, maybe the basic setup works. If I'm doing two things, I got to double that. If I'm doing four things, I got to quadruple that. And that's sort of like a basic way you can figure out your